Okay, so friends, today we are continuing in our series through the book of Genesis, and we actually only have a few sermons left in the series because we're going to end in Genesis chapter 11, and I think uh, uh, we've been going on for, for a while now. We're, we're in Genesis chapter 9, so we have about two or three more sermons left in the series, and then, and then we're done. And then after our series through the book of Genesis, we're going to move on to a series in the book of Ephesians. Okay, so it's a, a different style of literature in the Bible as in the New Testament. Hopefully, it'll be refreshing for us as we kind of he- see the whole counsel of God and how that can edify us. But for now, we're still at the tail end of Noah's story in the book of Genesis in chapter 9. And at this point of the story, what we've seen is that the flood of God's wrath, right, in Noah's day, it's finally died down. The earth is now once again habitable, right? And mankind got a second chance in life, so to speak. We have a new beginning, a new hope. But as second chances go, they often, if not always, come with a lesson, don't they? And, and the lesson that we as flood survivors are meant to learn here is arguably of the utmost importance. Why? Because the importance of the lesson usually corresponds with the heaviness of the calamity escaped. The importance of the lesson corresponds with the heaviness of the calamity escaped. What do I mean? For example, if you didn't study for an exam and you barely passed, you know, it's like, man, lesson learned. You know, I barely escaped failing, so I'll study better next time. You see, medium calamity escaped, medium important lesson. But what if, for example, you uh, one night drove while being drunk and you got in a wreck, nearly killing yourself and another person, but you escape that calamity. Then it's like, okay, you know, wow, lesson learned, like really learned. It's heavier this time. Why? Because the calamity you escaped was also weightier. The weight of the lesson corresponds to the calamity you escaped. Now, let me ask you, what calamity did mankind escape here in the flood story? We escaped utter annihilation. We escaped total extinction. Like, there is no calamity heavier than that. This means that the lesson we're supposed to learn here from escaping the flood is also of ultimate weightiness as well. The question is, what is it? What ultimately weighty lesson are you and I meant to learn here from the flood? What lesson could possibly be worth the weightiness of escaping utter annihilation? Okay, let's, let's get into it. This is God's word, taken from Genesis chapter 9, verse 1 to 17, about the events after the flood resided. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every morning, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you... Be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again 
become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I've established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Thus says the Lord. So we see at least three interconnected lessons that we're meant to take away here from this flood event. First, the sanctity of our life. Second, the worth of our neighbor. And third, the forbearance of our God. The sanctity of our life, the worth of our neighbor, and the forbearance of our God. Let's, let's start the first point, the sanctity of our life. So at this point, we've already had what? Uh, three, four sermons on the flood event since Genesis chapter 6. And if you've been with us um, since uh, the, the beginning of the flood event in these sermons, you would know that the main point of Noah's story here is recreation, right? Noah's story, the flood, is all about God recreating the earth because all of the sin that fell into it beforehand. But do you remember specifically what kind of sin made Noah's world to be in need of this cleansing flood? Specifically, it was a sin of violence and murder. You remember that? In Genesis chapter 6, you had the Nephilim, who were these like giant warlords who were violently ruling the land. And then you had people like Lamech, who celebrated the murdering of a young man and then displayed it as a way to show his strength and power by bragging about it to everyone. And, and, and these weren't just isolated events. The whole world, Genesis 6, 11 says, was covered, drenched in blood. It was filled with manslaughter, and it needed a new beginning. Which is why, if you remember, the whole flood story is filled with the Garden of Eden imageries and themes, right? Which you see here yet again in Genesis chapter 9. Look at verse 1 in our passage. Who does God tell, uh, what does God tell Noah to do here? Verse 1 says, uh, God tells Noah to be fruitful and multiply. What did God tell Adam to do in Genesis chapter 1? To be fruitful and multiply. And then look at verse 2. God tells Noah that the fear and dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. In other words, Noah's going to have this authority and power over animals and the beasts of the field. Who did God give authority and power over the beasts of the field in Genesis chapter 1? Adam and Eve. And then look at verse 3. God gave the plants as food for Noah. In Genesis 2, who did God give the plants as food for? Adam and Eve. You see that? Another repetition of the Genesis, in, uh, Genesis 1 and 2 new creation themes here. After the flood in Genesis 9, saying to those who survived the flood that here's your second chance, mankind. Here's your new beginning. You know, let's give this thing another go. But, and here's the lesson. There's one additional command that God gave to Noah here in Genesis 9 that he never gave to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 or 2. If you read the text, what is it? Some of you might have caught it. It's in verse 4. God said, you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. That command was never given to Adam in Genesis 1 and 2. It was an added on command here in Genesis 9 after the flood. And the question is, what's the lesson there? What a funny command, right? So the lesson we're meant to learn here from escaping utter annihilation is that we should never ever order medium rare steaks again at restaurants. Like that seems like it doesn't connect, okay? No, that's, that's not the point of this command. Okay, so what is it? Well, again, remember, the whole reason why the flood happened in the first place is because everyone was murdering everyone. Everyone was spilling their neighbor's blood and drenching the world in it. So God's here saying, look, guys, you get a second chance, okay? Let's give this thing another go. But this time, let's try to minimize the blood. <laughs> let's keep that to a minimum, okay? See, see back then, blood was the closest physical element that was associated with this invisible entity called life. Life is a reality, an entity that you can't, you can't touch it, right? What is it? Where is it? And blood is its closest representative in the physical world. So when God here, after the flood, repeats all the commands he gave Adam and Eve in the garden, but then adds, don't eat blood, he's saying, you guys get a second chance, 
But man, you got to stop the killing. <laughs> you got to stop killing. Which is why after this, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and 1 Samuel, Israel is commanded to drain out the lifeblood from all the animals that they're going to eat. A command that no longer applies today because God put a stop to these strict dietary laws in the book of Acts. But the point back then remains. At the time, Israel was not meant to eat meat with blood in it because they have to remember that lifeblood is sacred and they got to treat it with dignity. Okay, I see that, but it still seems a bit extra, right? You, you got to eat dry steak to remember that life is sacred. That seems a bit over the top. Sure, it might be, but when something is that precious to you, what happens usually is that the security protocol around it also gets a bit extra, doesn't it? For example, when the president passes by, you ever been around when the president passes by? The protection around him is a bit extra, right? Secret service guys around him, roads are scanned prior to his arrival, bulletproof gas everywhere. People can't even come into the same airspace as him. A bit over the top, maybe. Or, I just learned this, did you know that the Mona Lisa is placed in a bulletproof glass container and it sits on top of an automatic falling dock which is set to immediately drop the painting to a secure underground room if it's ever threatened. It's like, man, so labai, right? It's so, so extra. Like, why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the Mona Lisa and the president's life is of immeasurably valuable and, and precious to the people who assigned the protection around it. Got to eat dry meat my whole life? <laughs> the Israelites might have asked. It's so extra. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. God's saying here. Because life, to me, is immeasurably valuable and precious. That's why. And look, that's, that's not new to, to most people, right? Most people would agree to the fact that life is precious. But the thing is, if we actually look at the way we treat other people, and if we actually look at the way we view the value of our own life, I, I'm not sure that we actually believe this claim as much as we say we do. We view other people as more and less valuable, and we view our own life as well as being more and less valuable based on what? The add-on items that our life may encounter in this momentary world that we live in. But God's saying here is that if you're a human being, simply with lifeblood pumping through your veins, regardless of the add-on items that you may encounter in this life, it doesn't matter. You are of utmost importance to him. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much other people like you or don't like you. It doesn't matter how high or low your position may be in your company. It doesn't matter what family background you come from. It doesn't matter how physically attractive you may or may not be. If you're here today and you're alive, which I assume is everyone, you are precious to God. You have something that God values as sacred, no matter what you've done and no matter what's been done to you. A theologian once said, whether righteous or sinful, whether rich or poor, whether satisfying or irritating, the austere generality of the sixth commandment, which is do not kill, puts a protective shield among all human life and deems it sacred. What would the world look like, pray tell, if we valued life in the same way God did, as sacredly as God does? It'll change a whole lot of things, wouldn't it? And one of the main things I think it'll change is the way we treat our neighbor, which leads to the second point, the worth of our neighbor. So I don't usually use movie analogies in my sermons, okay? But all the cool pastors are doing it, so let's, let's give it a shot. You've seen Inception, right? Dream states and all that, okay. If you haven't, the premise of Inception is that if you want to change someone's external behavior, you can't just change the surface layer behavior. That's not enough. 
if you want to change someone's behavior, you've got to go deeper into the person's belief system and change that. That's, that's what you've got to change, okay? And that's kind of what God's doing here in, in the next passage, uh, part of the passage. Just now, in verses 1 to 4, we heard the surface one level layer behavioral command, right? Don't kill other people. Great. But we also saw God go a level deeper there and explains to us why this command applies. Because, second deeper layer, life is precious, right? It's a layer one command is based on a layer two truth. But then here in verse six, God goes even a step deeper. And he explains to us why is life so precious? And the answer, if you read verse 6, is because man is made in the image of God, or the imago Dei. That's the deepest layer. That is a starting point. And if you don't have that starting point view of life, you don't have a solid foundation to support the ethical command. Do you, you see what I'm saying? You can't confirm the ethical command to not kill human beings like animals if in your foundational belief system, you don't also have something that intrinsically separates human beings from animals. You see, the biblical worldview gives you that. It gives you a solid ground foundation to the ethics that you know is right. It's not unique for for people to say, don't kill human beings, okay? Everyone says that human life is precious. What's unique about Christianity, however, is that it gives you a a solid foundation for that claim. What's that foundation? It's the claim that unlike animals, mankind is made in the image of God. There's something different. There's something special about the lifeblood of man compared to the rest of creation. We mirror God. You know what this means? This means that if you want to behold the thing that is closest to the glory of God on earth, you don't have to go all the way to Uluwatu and look at the sunset. You don't have to go all the way to Nepal to see Everest. You don't have to go all the way to, I don't know, Arizona to see the Grand Canyon. You know what you got to do? Turn to your side and look at the person sitting next to you. (laughs) That is the closest thing on earth to the glory of God. There's less glory in the rising sun than in the day that their life begun. And this isn't feel-good theology. Just because a doctrine feels good doesn't mean it's not true. (laughs) This This is what God's saying. Your life is priceless. The life of the person sitting next to you is priceless. That's why God said in verse 6 that whoever sheds the blood of man, by man his blood be shed. A lifeblood for a lifeblood. See, if someone owns a piece of jewelry and you ask them, hey, how much for that piece of jewelry? And they say a million dollars. You know what that means? That means that piece of jewelry is not priceless. There's a price to it. There's a number to it. But if you ask them, hey, how much for that piece of jewelry? And they say, the price of this piece of jewelry is this piece of jewelry. It's like, okay, what? Okay, how much do you want for it? Like, what what can I trade for it? And they go, the only thing you can trade for it is it itself. You know what they're saying? They're saying that it's priceless. The only thing equal to its value is itself. It's a currency all to itself. The only acceptable price for someone's lifeblood is lifeblood. It's priceless. And that's what you have. That's what your neighbor has. And you know what we're meant to do with this glorious Imago Dei that we have? We are meant to spread it all over the earth. It needs to cover the earth. What needs to cover the earth is God's glory, not blood. That's the point here, which is why God told Noah in verse 7 to be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth, cover it with my glory, stop killing it. That's the command. But Tez, I've never killed anyone, you might say. Well, 
It's a good start. But remember, it's not just about the layer one external behavior, right? It's about whether or not you've lived your life in such a way that treats the human beings around you with the kind of dignity and sacredness that God's image deserves. So that includes when our kids are throwing horrible tantrums, when our spouse is being unbelievably stubborn, when our friends are being terribly foolish, when our employers are being utterly unreasonable, and when our employees are being immature and difficult. In those moments, do you still treat them as if they're more glorious than mountains? That's a bit extra, isn't it, Taz? Maybe it feels extra because we don't actually understand just how precious life is. By the way, I'm curious. Might have there been a face that popped in your mind just now as you're listening to the sermon of someone in your life who you fail to treat with the kind of sacred dignity God says lifeblood deserves. If I'm honest, there's someone that pops in my mind. No one here, don't worry. Because I'm a sinner, right? And I haven't learned my lesson. And everything in me just wants to justify it. Everything in me wants to say to God, you don't understand the situation. God, there's a lot of nuance to it, you see. If you really knew the whole story, you know, they're not making it easy on me. And look, that's probably true. Whose ever face popped into your mind probably hasn't made it easy on you. But whether sinful or righteous, whether rich or poor, whether kind or mean, whether broken or whole, whether annoying or pleasant, if they possess life, God has marked them sacred. So, how are we doing? If you look into our own hearts, and we look at the state of the world today, would you say that mankind has learned their lesson? Have we stopped the killing? Have we stopped the shootings? Have we stopped the wars? Have we minimized the blood? Or is the world still drenched in it like it was in Noah's day? Are our relationships still marked by it? Have we learned our lesson? Based on what I've seen in my lifetime, I'd say we haven't. We haven't. And see, God knew this would happen. He's not surprised. Remember last Sunday in our passage in Genesis 8, at the end there, after the flood resided, God said, the intention of man's heart is still evil from his youth. He said that after the flood resided. So he knew. He knew mankind hasn't really learned this lesson. We still don't regard life with the same level of value that God does. So then why is he letting us live on? That's the question. Why is he letting us go on, although we haven't learned our lesson? Let's go to our last point. The forbearance of our God. Let's see why. God tells us why in verses 8 to 11. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Why is God letting us live? Because of his covenant. Finally, a passage that gives me explicit permission to rant about what a covenant is. I'll make it short, okay? But this is really, really important for us. We won't understand the passage unless we get this point. What is a covenant? Briefly, okay, a covenant, like Sam alluded to earlier, is a legal relationship between two parties that involves a blessing and a curse. It's a legal relationship between two parties that involves a blessing and a curse. If both parties do their part of the deal to keep the covenant, they'll both be blessed. For example, if the deal is Kingdom A gives food to Kingdom B, and Kingdom B will send troops to protect Kingdom A, if both parties keep their part of the covenant requirement, they're both blessed. Kingdom A is blessed by protection, and Kingdom B is blessed by food. 
But if one party breaks the deal, that party, whoever it is, will be cursed. What's the curse? Well, the curse is usually marked by a physical sign. So, for example, in the covenant that God made with Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, God said, circumcision is the covenant sign. Circumcision. If mankind blesses God with their obedience, God will bless them with his protection and presence. But if mankind doesn't bless, if, they don't, if we don't do our part of the covenant deal, then circumcision reminds Israel that they'll be cut off from God's presence. Or with Moses, for example, if Israel blesses God by obeying the Ten Commandments, God will continue to bless them with his protection and presence as well. And the covenant sign is all the blood shed by all the sacrificial animals at the time, the Passover lamb, other sacrificial animals. So the consequences of breaking the covenant is death, the shed of blood, as portrayed in the physical sign of the animals. Okay? Throughout the Bible, here it is. Okay, stick with me. Covenant signs are physical signs that mankind are commanded to execute, circumcision, anim sacrificial animals, we're meant to execute it in order to remind us about keeping our part of the deal. Okay? Still with me? Here's what's interesting about this passage. With this covenant sign, however, in Genesis chapter 9, with the Noahic covenant, unlike other covenant signs in the Bible, this covenant sign was not a sign that mankind executed to remind them to keep their side of the deal. If you read it again carefully, this covenant sign was a covenant sign that God executed to remind him to keep his part of the deal. You see, I'll place my rainbow in the sky, not you, but me. That's a sign. And when I see this, God says in verse 15, I'll be reminded that I will never again wipe everyone out with a flood like this. St stick with me a little longer, okay? Now, we all know that God isn't this forgetful child who needs to be reminded of his promise with bright, pretty colors in the sky, okay? It's not like he's up there going, you know, why I oughta. But then he sees a rainbow and he goes, oh, I'm not angry anymore. <laughs> of course, that's not what this means. Okay, so then what's the point of the rainbow? It's God saying this, look, I know y'all are going to break your part of the deal. That is no question. The heart of man remains evil even after the flood. I know that. You'll kill again. You won't treat your, your, your neighbor with dignity. You'll treat people differently based on money. You know, you won't be agents of life. You'll be agents of death. But I will not make you pay. God's saying here. I will not make you pay for the covenant curse you deserve. Okay. So who will pay for this covenant curse? Will they just vanish into thin air? No. God, through this covenant sign, is saying that he will. This is an interesting observation from the passage. The word that God used here to describe the rainbow is actually the word bow, like a, like a weapon, like a bow and arrow used for war. God here is setting his bow, his weapon, where? On earth? in the heavens. What's he saying? He's saying this. Although you're the ones who didn't keep your part of the covenant deal, I won't make you pay. My bow will be set to the heavens instead of the earth. And, and no one really knew exactly what this meant until someone who claimed to have come down from heaven, one day sat with his disciples, broke bread, poured wine, and said, take it, drink it. This is my blood of the covenant, poured for the forgiveness of your sins. What will calm God's wrath down isn't a rainbow. It's the promise that he in heaven will pay for the covenant curse that we deserve. 
when you sin, God says here, when you break your part of the deal, I will remember this bow. I'll remember the cross, and I will not flood you in my wrath anymore for breaking your part of the deal. But for how long, God, will you remember this covenant sign? Look at verse 16. He said this is an everlasting covenant, meaning forever. That's the gospel. That's Christianity. That's what this is all about. If you've received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God will never, ever flood you with his wrath, although you deserve it. Why not? Because he'll remember the cross where all of your sins have been paid by him. And this God who shed his lifeblood for you is now asking you to value the lifeblood of your fellow man. But God, what if they don't deserve it? What if, what if they break their part of the deal? Then remember the covenant sign, friends. Remember the one who took the bow because you broke your part of the deal. If you only love those who deserve it, what makes you any different than the tax collectors, Jesus asked his disciples? The Christian operates with a different and unique underlying worldview, a worldview that honors the sanctity of life, a worldview that sees God's image even in the worst of us, and a worldview that is not marked by revenge, but by mercy. So, Covenant City Church, how about as flood survivors, we take this lesson seriously. How about we show to the world our God who took the bow for us by treating and loving others in the same way? Anyone, everyone, regardless of who, from here on out. Let's pray. Father, we are stubborn people. Just like the Israelites who traveled through the desert to the promised land, your people today is no different. We have hard heads. We have unfeeling hearts. And even though we've been forgiven by you when you paid our part of the covenant breaking, we still haven't learned our lesson. We don't value life in the way you do. We assign different kinds of worth to different kinds of people based on the earthly add-ons you might have given them in this momentary journey. And we have failed you over and over again. But yet, our covenant-keeping God came down and fulfilled his part of the deal. He, he, he stayed true. You stayed true to your word. And you remembered your bow set to the heavens that you would take our place, that we may be set free. Let us, Father, now love your images on earth. Let us now treat others with the same kind of love, dignity, mercy, forgiveness, long-suffering, endurance, that they deserve not only as image bearers, um, but as we're called to, as those who's received unfathomable mercy and grace on that cross. In Jesus' name. We pray. Amen.